Welcome to this episode of the Structural Engineering Channel podcast, a podcast focused on helping structural engineering professionals stay up to date on technical trends in the field and to help them succeed in their careers and lives. In this episode, I'm going to interview my co-host, Matt Picardle, who recently took the SE exam. He'll be talking about his experience taking the SE exam, what the exam is, why it's so difficult, how he studied, and the benefits of earning SE licensure. I'm your co-host, Alexis Clark. I work in Hilti's North American headquarters as the product manager of our chemical anchoring portfolio in the US and Canada. I'm a licensed professional engineer in Texas. I received my bachelor's in civil engineering from UT Austin, and I'm currently an MBA candidate at Auburn. Now, before we introduce Matt to those of you that might not know him yet, I'd like to share some exciting news with you. The Engineering Management Institute, the publisher of this podcast, has recently launched two brand new YouTube channels, how to pass your PE exam and how to pass your FE exam that will be focused on helping engineering professionals like you prepare for these career changing exams. Please check them out if you are currently preparing for the exams as they contain some great tips and tricks for exam preparation. Links will be added in the show notes of this episode. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our guest and my co-host, Matt McCardle. Matt is a licensed professional engineer practicing on structural engineering projects in California with an undergraduate degree from Cal Poly Pomona and a master's in structural engineering from UC San Diego. He has designed and managed various types of building structures, including residential wood apartment buildings, commercial steel buildings, and concrete parking structures and towers. Matt is also the creator and host of the Structural Engineering Life channel on YouTube. And with that, let's jump into our conversation with Matt. Matt, welcome back to the Structural Engineering Channel podcast. Hey, Alexis. It's good to be back. I know I I was on a hiatus for a little bit, but it's good to be back. (laughs) And that's a perfect segue. So not only are we going to talk about this fantastic, interesting topic today about the SE exam, tell us, why were you on a hiatus for a little while? Yeah, exactly that. I was uh, studying for the SE exam. I pretty much just told everybody, guys, (laughs) all my extracurriculars, I just dropped. I was like, I got to study. It's it's uh, almost a month in, so that's when I took priority and just uh, buckled down and uh, isolated myself and just put my head down and studied for the. Absolutely, you know, for it's important and, to do that sometimes. Sometimes you just need to to prioritize and and tell people, hey, look, I'm here for the long haul, but I need a month to to knock this out or whatever that looks like. And I'm I'm glad you exercised that ability because I know I'm still struggling to do that. So you're inspiring me. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> I love it. Wonderful. Well, let's just go ahead and dive right into this topic. I'm, I'm really interested to hear what you have to say. I know I have only heard things here and there about the SE exam, and it's mostly from people who have taken it before. So I'm looking forward to you uh, sharing the facts with us today. Sure. So let's start with just telling us what is the SE exam? The SE exam is a specialty license. It's something that you get uh, for civil engineers. You get your FE, then you get your PE. But if you're a specialty like structural engineering, Uh, you have the option of getting your SE exam. It's an advanced license that uh, allows you to pretty much work on more advanced projects like hospitals, like risk category four or the really important buildings. They allow you to sign off and stamp those and also high rises. So that's in terms of licensing and stamping, that's what it's for. It's definitely not required in all the states, but at least for me in California, it was a a requirement. So for me, I needed to take it. (laughs) Perfect. Okay. So you mentioned that this is a a requirement in the state of California. Do you know about other states around the U.S. where it might also be a requirement or uh, highly recommended, we can say? Yes. I I haven't looked in it too much, but I'm pretty sure Illinois has one. And I'm not sure if New York has has it too, but uh, I know for sure the West Coast country or states, California, I know it's pretty common in Seattle, and even uh, Oregon. I'm not sure if they're required by state, but you know, for my colleagues there, uh, it's pretty common for them to have an SE license, especially if they're in the higher up positions like principal levels. Gotcha, so it might also be required or, or highly recommended for um, even just business acceleration if you wanted to be in more of a project management and leadership role. Yes, for sure, and, and at least for me, that was one of the main reasons for that, because I'm okay. not gonna be stamping those 
by myself anytime soon. So I, I absolutely, <laughs> I totally get that. And that would be very intimidating to me as well. Um, so really quickly. So you mentioned that this is additional to the PE. So do you have to have the PE before you pursue an SE? Yes. The requirements are after you get your PE license, you need to be working under an SE license structural engineer for three years. Then you can take your SE license. So it is wow. something that you need to take probably five years into your career. Uh, so you can't really take it right off the bat. You need to get your experience, work under an SE, and then you can apply for it. Holy man. So depending on the state that you're in, depend, uh, whether or not your state has decoupled the ability um, to get, take your PE exam, it's you have to get PE licensure and then have the additional three years under an SE to then take the, exam, the SE exam. Yes, for sure. And it's it's the same exam for all the states. They made it national. So okay. it used to be kind of confusing before, but it's the same test everywhere in the US. Wow. Oh my so, goodness. That's, yeah. that's a lot of time. That really takes a lot of dedication and commitment to, to be able to achieve that milestone. Yeah, it's definitely a lot. <laughs> I can definitely go into that more. <laughs> Excellent. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive into that. So um, we've mentioned a little bit about the succession between the two, but for you, kind of what's the difference between the PE and the SE? The PE, if I compare the PE to the SE, it's obviously it's all structural engineering. It's all in the PE. You can kind of get like general uh, civil and you can pick your, your discipline, but in the SE, it's it's all, oh man, it's it's all structural. There's so much structural uh, topics and and subjects that that fill in your gaps of knowledge from working. That it's definitely a, a lot tougher. And if you're talking about just the difficulty of the licensing, I, I yeah, I, it's for the PE. I studied about a hundred hours for the SE three to 400 hours for sure. So oh kind of just the difference of like the testing. The fact that you logged your hours is impressive. That's not, I mean, I don't want to know. Actually, I, I would be embarrassed to tell you what, how many hours I studied for the PE. <laughs> so we'll just leave that as a, as a big question mark and mystery for our listeners. But that is really some, some dedication there. That's impressive. Um, perfect. So Matt, I think you've been really clear about um, some of the situations in which a, a, an SE might be required or, or very much mandatory for you to progress in your job. But what are some other perks of having the SE licensure behind your name? Well, for me, technically, even if I wasn't required to take it for, for whatever reason, like my state didn't require it, I definitely don't regret taking it because it's filled in a lot of the structural engineering gaps in my career. Like for me, I work with a lot of materials. So I thought I was pretty well prepared, you know, wood, concrete, steel. So it's something I do on an everyday basis. But studying for the SE in that depth filled in a lot of the gaps because you have to know pretty much everything um, or at least all the basics on how to design, you know, structural members, how to design for seismic. So it's definitely made me a better engineer. And I think for me, that was one of the best things because it gave me that confidence of it doesn't matter what material I get, what, what project I get, I at least have the confidence to know that I know how to, to, to deal with it. I know how to approach it. So in terms of just becoming a better engineer, it definitely forced me to do that, you know? Uh, so that's, I think that's one benefit of just taking the SE. Um, obviously it requires on your state and you got to take into account the time investment it it puts into it, but even if it's not required in your state, I like to look at it as a, a future investment. Because unless you're certainly absolutely clear on where you want to go, where you want to work for like the next 50 years, who knows, your state might actually make it an eventual requirement. Or if you want to move to a state that does require it, you already have it. And especially if you have your SE it's, and you move to a state that does require it, it does really look uh, good because SEs are rare because the test is for sure definitely difficult. So yes, it definitely makes a, there's definitely a job security factor in there too. 
Yeah. Well, and so I love the point that you say that even just preparing for the exam has made you a better engineer because it really is like filled in those little gaps and, and has made you a better technical expert. Um, so for some, someone who's thinking about, you know, where they see themselves in their future, it could be a really nice uh, a credential and, and milestone to hit that really shows your technical expertise to your firm um, and kind of, you know, secures your, uh, your job security there. I think something else that's really interesting is you mentioned, you know, you might want to move someplace that requires an SE or your state might require it in the future. I think another thing that that's probably um, a truth that's been revealed even more so during 2020 is that the, the lines of geography are blurring more and more. And if you are a, an engineer in Montana and you maybe don't need an SE license, your firm, if they're growing, is probably trying to secure different cool projects that are in different states. They're trying to round out the, you know, the number of states that they can pursue work in. And you having an SC license can definitely give you the edge in allowing your firm the business side um, to, to go after those projects and evolve their business and their portfolio of projects they've had. So um, it sounds like there's definitely more than one way that this can be really beneficial, whether you decide to move or want to stay where you are for forever. Yeah, that's a great point about the, the business side because yeah, our firm, we're in, you know, the firm I'm working for right now, we're at multiple states. And yeah, the SE is really good for that because you can go into any state and basically get work. So it's definitely a, a good requirement. I love it. Excellent. So now we're going to dive into your personal journey with the SE. So we're going to get real up close and, and in the weeds. Um, tell us a little bit about how you prepared for this exam. I mean, three to 400 hours, that's a lot of preparation. Yes. So <laughs> I know it was a, I, I first tried to split it up because you can take the test in two parts. There's two parts, the lateral and the gravity side. So you can split up the test. I initially tried to do that, but then COVID kept hitting and the test kept getting canceled. And so it got to the point where I studied, but then you forget everything because six months later, you got to study again. So I ended up taking both of them at the same time. Uh, which I don't rec don't recommend, but. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what would you, so had COVID not happened, which I know everyone is wishing that right now, how would you have done it? Yeah, uh, I would have taken uh, gravity first and then lateral, or at least split them up into two sessions because it's, it's a lot, uh, it's a lot to learn and definitely a lot to remember. So I knew that going in. So I, how I would study, I actually took a class because, you know, I didn't want to spend all that time like doing it by myself. And it gave me a stricter schedule. It held me accountable going to class and whatnot. So I did it for me and get me more organized and give me some resources to help me out instead of, because there's, I know there's some people that just read the straight out code books. And I feel that's at least torture for me if that's your route of uh, <laughs> of going for studying. It's, it's definitely possible. I know people have done it, but that didn't sound too great for me. I'd rather have uh, someone, you know, guide me through, uh, basically like a, a guide, a, a guy, a guy person that's taking you through the exam and they've done it a million times. And they're showing me the pitfalls of where people make mistakes on the exam, what to focus on, uh, what's going to be on the test. So for me, I took a class, which was really helpful. And uh, that was my way of studying. It kept me in a schedule and it gave me a lot of homework. It's important to have that structure sometimes, especially if you're someone who may not be the most diligent studier. So I, I understand completely. Sometimes you have to have someone else give you an outline and make you show up. Yes, for sure. That was a big reason for me because it was, if I don't have that pressure, I'm probably not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I ha I'm curious. So you mentioned that you, you would have taken gravity before lateral. Is there a reason that you sequence them in that, in that way? Or is that pretty standard how most people do it? I think for me, uh, my reasoning was if I knew the gravity aspects, then the lateral uh, portions would be a little easier because maybe for a lateral portion, they might tell you to design a concrete column and uh, because of the lateral forces. So you still got to know your gravity for lateral. Okay. At least in my thinking. Okay. No, that, uh, hey, that makes total sense. I can follow. Interesting. So three to 400 hours. And is this, so in case someone didn't catch it earlier, you had planned to take the SE in April and then that was clearly killed when, uh, yep. when the pandemic <laughs> roared its ugly head towards the U.S. So does yeah. that three to 400 hours 
account for the setting you did before April and the setting you did between April and October when you took it this year? Yes, it did because I know I started studying for gravity and a lot of that time was class time. I think class time definitely uh, more than 100 hours, but a lot, the majority of that study time is uh, problems. Lots and lots and lots of problems where to the point you're sick of doing them, but <laughs> you know, that's, uh, that's kind of the extent of it. And there's just so many subjects. That's one of the most challenging parts about it is it's so broad. Like even though you know steel really well, they could give you a concrete slab problem that you've never done by hand. Uh, another thing by hand, you need to know it by hand. I know a lot of people use computers. So if you don't know how to do it by hand and they just give you a question out of nowhere, I mean, that's gonna hurt you a lot. So it's really broad. Like you need to know a lot of everything. Absolutely. So what I'm also hearing, I know you and I have had this like theme this year. We bring, we're bringing in so many different speakers that are typically um, talking about this new technology or, or using AI in structural engineering. And while it is so important to know what that, that computed uh, calculation is doing, if you don't know the calculations behind it, it's, it's a whole bunch of gobbledygook, right? It's just numbers and data and you don't have a really good sense, it's an engineering sense about what's happening. Um, so for our, our younger listeners who always ask, what program should I know? You need another program of you and a pencil and putting your hand to the piece of paper and be able to, to write it out because that's, that's the basis of what we're testing our structural engineers on today because you need to know how to calculate it on your own. You can't rely on the technology. Exactly. And yeah, like I was saying, what makes you a better engineer, you know, all the limit states and what you're checking and all that stuff, it definitely does make you a better engineer. So um, you're not so reliant on the computer. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So what was the toughest part that you had to study for? What was the toughest part about preparation? For me, the gravity test was, I think, definitely harder than the lateral, just because with gravity, uh, like I was mentioning, it's, it's so broad. You have to know everything. Um, like uh, even, even the, the tough parts studying for were the bridge. Like you need, even though you're not gonna, you're, you're a building engineer, you still need to know bridge design, which is a completely different code and you've never done it before. And yes, you have to, you have, you have to know bridges. Like if you don't know how to use and design bridges, you're not gonna pass. So it's, it's like 25% of the test. So a lot of building engineers just think, oh, I do buildings and they don't, they don't study for bridges. They're not gonna do well. So it's something, oh, no that you do have to study for too, even though it's a completely different code and, and whatnot, it's, it's a requirement. And same thing for bridge engineers. I feel sorry for them because they have to know all the building stuff too. Yes. Yeah, so it's, it's definitely tough on, on both sides. Oh my God. Yeah, that's good. Hey, you know, and if nothing else, then you get a little bit of empathy for the other side. Yeah, I, I can, oh. at least I know how to work on bridges now or at least <laughs> start right? with the philosophies of it. You've got one more card in your, in your deck of hands, exactly. your, your hand of cards. That's great. <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious, where did you take the exam? How did it go? And what was the first thing that you did to celebrate when you walked out of those doors? Yes, it was a journey. Uh, went to Las Vegas and even, you know, there was always that, there was always that not guarantee that they might, they still might cancel it. Even like, a couple of weeks before the tests. So I was like, they better still, you know, they better not cancel it. And then they, they were still making some last minute changes to, uh, I think a couple of days before the test, they changed our test location to another Las Vegas site. So it was a whole bunch of scrambling, but um, you know, you know, thanks for them and CES for you know, scheduling that. I know they couldn't do it in California. So we had to drive to Las Vegas. California wouldn't allow any testing. So everyone in California that wanted to take it, they all drove to Las Vegas or, or Reno, I believe too, if you were like in the SF area. But uh, yeah, big effort on NCES. So thanks for them for that effort and allowing us to do that. Uh, but yeah, it was a, literally a journey. We had a drive over there and going into a casino. It was a casino that our test center was at. So it was really- What a unique experience. <laughs> was it, was the testing because of COVID, was the testing facility any different than your, your PE was? During the exam, the good thing about it was we did have to wear masks for sure. So during the entire test, we're wearing masks. 
uh, we were separated. We each had our own tables. That was probably the best part. You know, typically you're, you have like two or three people without COVID, you know, regular testing. But now with COVID, they do spread you out and you do have your own table. So that was probably the best part about it. But yeah. Lots of space. Going into the casino and, and uh, seeing how they prepared for COVID and following all the rules. I officially, I, I officially have no sympathy for anyone who complains about wearing a mask for a short <laughs> amount of time because you had to wait, take, wear one while you took an eight-hour structural engineering exam. Yep. And it was, uh, you guys could do it. No complaining about there. I was like, <laughs> I think you survived one of the most miserable experiences ever. I tease. I'm I, you've been talking about how worth, how absolutely worthwhile this, this entire thing is. And I'm sure it, it is going to be in the long run. It's very exciting. Yeah. I, yeah, it's definitely a good experience. At least now that I'm looking back at it, not when I was going through it. Yes. Matt, what are some of the preparation resources that are out there for candidates who think they might want to take the SE? Sure, there's a couple different ways. You can either take a course like I was mentioning or you can do self-studying. Uh, so I, I did actually have the resources for both of those. I, you know, I took the course, but then I also had some additional material. And there's actually a good list. If you want to do self-study by yourself, there's a good list. Uh, if you Google N-C-S-E-A-S-E -S -S -E study guide, they have a list of a lot of the references, materials, uh, code books, uh, guides for studying for the S-E. So if you want to go buying your own books route and studying yourself, that's a good route. So definitely Google that and look that up. They have a lot of uh, resources and additional books that even I myself got. Or you can take a class. Um, there's a lot of classes out there. I can only speak upon, you know, the class that I took. Uh, I took AEI and they were really good because at least for me, you know, they, they provided me a lot of uh, cheat sheets. So instead of reading the code, going through different code sections, they kind of just summarized everything um, as simply as I think possible. So you can use it as a reference because it is open book. So I definitely use those a lot and they saved me a lot of study time. I were to study it by myself. So besides keeping me organized and going to classes and doing homework, that was another good thing. They provided me resources uh, with that. But that was a class that I took, you know, that I just had a good experience, experience with. And, um, but I know there's a lot of other good classes out there too. So you just got to ask around. Perfect. Okay, so you had this, this different, this slightly different, you had your whole desk to yourself, you had eight hours wearing a mask, took this exam, What'd you do when you walk out the doors? Yeah, after I walked out the door, drove back home, and it was great to have a weekend to just, uh, what, I'd, I'd order food. Like, I didn't do anything. I was super lazy that weekend. It was so nice to have a weekend off. You know, just <laughs> turned on Netflix, uh, caught up on The Office. That was a show that I was watching and catching up on, and uh, ordered coffee and, and ordered food. And I just laid on my couch for the whole weekend, didn't do anything uh, super unproductive, which was awesome. I I'd say you've earned it. That. I'd say you've earned it. Absolutely. Although I am going to say you kind of just glossed over the Las Vegas part. Like, oh yeah, I took my exam. And then I walked to my car and immediately drove home. We won't ask. <laughs> Actually, like, you know, some of my coworkers were there too. And uh, we did uh, meet up. We were all just mentally um, exhausted. Like we, you know, we, we, we got dinner, but then... After that, it was, guys were, were brain fried. And I, we, I think we all went to bed like at 10 or 11. It was just like, <laughs> we were just so fried after that, after 16 hours of test taking. We, you know, we celebrated a little bit, but then we were just like, okay, I'm done. Absolutely. I, <laughs> Dinner was enough. <laughs> I totally get it. Yeah, that's, you have to talk to people during that amount of time. You, have, you haven't socialized all year, so you're out of practice. Yeah, I was like, how do I talk to people again? Oh, yes, hi. <laughs> That takes probably a lot more energy than it used to nowadays. It was definitely weird being quarantined and then seeing all these people in Vegas. It was like, whoa, people. <laughs> a little walking. bit of a shock. <laughs> yes, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, I'm glad you celebrated a little bit and you certainly deserve that time, that downtime for sure. Wonderful. So my final question to you is, you, know, you've, you told us a little bit about your story and, and why you're pursuing this really huge monumentous milestone. Um, I'm curious, what is it that you recommend to others? So we've got these listeners who are 
um, I mean, you know, anywhere from college to about to prepare for their PE and maybe considering getting an SE. I mean, I'm most impressed because you're now four to six to seven years out of school, depending on a master's. And now you're having to go back to really get in the swing of like hardcore structural engineering studying for this exam. Um, that's, that takes a lot of, of foresight and planning. And I'm curious what your words of wisdom are to our listeners. Yeah, definitely look into what you want to, where you see yourself in your career path. Cause you know, this is an exam that you just take like, Oh, I got to get it anyways. No, it's, it's, it's tough. The pass rates aren't that good. So if you average it out 30 to 40%, so it's not just a test that you can just take and yeah, I'll pass it. No, like I think most people it'll take them a full year to actually pass it. So it is definitely a big time commitment. So if you're going to take it, you want to make sure that it fits into your long-term plans as an engineer where you're at. Um, but again, uh, like we were mentioning earlier, Alexis, just because it's not in your state, hey, look, 10, 15 years, see what it can do for your career. Like, does that fit into to your career path? Is it going to be benefit you in the long run? Um, but I do think it is, uh, at least for a structural engineer that works on, on buildings, definitely worthwhile. Absolutely. I'm convinced. Although I won't be taking it anytime soon. <laughs> Matt, thank you so much for those recommendations. I'm sure our listeners who are considering pursuing their SE are very grateful to have this insight into what the exam looks like, some of the benefits, and uh, how one can prepare to ace it like you did. Thanks so much, Alexis. I'll, I'll find out probably in December, but uh, I feel good about it and that's all I can ask for. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's behind you and now only the future is, is ahead, bright future. Yeah, and just like as a closing note, I know if, if you're taking it, it's... Yeah, like I was saying, the pass rates aren't that, that great, but, you know, I think once you take it and, you know, don't be discouraged. I know a lot of people might get discouraged. This is the advice that I've gotten to is, uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a tough test. And once you study for it, you know, take it again and you'll be better prepared for it. So definitely for those that are taking it, don't get discouraged if, uh, if you don't pass. And like, like Alexis was saying, the, the hard part's done. Now it's, you studied for it. Maybe you got your weaknesses that you got to work on, but next time you don't have to study that much. I think most of it's already ingrained in your head and you just got to sharpen your pencil on, on, on a little bit of things, but it's definitely a tough process and definitely common if uh, you don't uh, pass it on the first try. I love it. At first you don't succeed, just take the test once more. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Matt. No problem, Lexus. Thanks. We hope you enjoyed the episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and questions. To leave them, please visit structuralengineeringchannel.com. There you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, which is lucky number 40, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during the episode. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you tune into your podcasts. Until next time, we wish you the best in all of your structural engineering endeavors.